Funding for this program is provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of the complete line of Cajun King Seafood Seasoning Mixes and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. Additional funding is provided by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Anytime, any place. In Louisiana, we're really cooking. Chef John Falls welcoming you to the bayous of South Louisiana. Today, Cajun and Creole cooking holds a prime spot in the world of international cuisine, and I would love for you to know a little bit about it. So why not sit back, relax, and join me and some of my friends as we cook up another great taste of Louisiana. and welcome to A Taste of Louisiana. I'm Chef John Falls, and today we're taking Louisiana cooking international. I've been real fortunate to be the American chef to travel all over the world bringing a little taste of this Louisiana to countries all over the globe, and we're going to talk about some of those countries and some of the dishes that we actually prepared there. And visiting with me today is a great, great friend of mine from New Orleans, Louisiana, Alec Gifford, and Alec has been a news anchor with WDSU television in that city, but he's also a great cook, and he was there with me every time we left to bring Louisiana cooking overseas. So he's going to come out and visit with us, and we're going to have just a great time cooking after a while. But let's talk about some of the countries we've been to, and just a, a little bit about what we've seen as we brought Louisiana cooking around the world. And some of the countries we've been in, like everybody recognizes Big Ben, of course, and of, what's this, the Eiffel Tower with a little Louisiana hot sauce? Is my hat leaning or the tower? Now it's the tower in uh, Roman Colosseum. Boy, isn't this beautiful. That was a fabulous shot down in Rome. St. Peter's Basilica. I was actually there to cook for the Holy Father, Pope John Paul. There he is. And this was a private audience with him in his home in, uh, at Castel Gandolfo. What a fabulous, fabulous visit. Moscow. I actually opened the first American restaurant there in 1988. And this was the press conference that we did. I'll tell you, I hate for you to have to watch my home movies, but this is what we're looking at today. Every country we go into, of course, we have to buy our own vegetables and produce. So it's great to be able to walk around the markets and look at all of the great things available in those countries. Here we are in Beijing, China, right under the picture of Chairman Mao. And I was the first American chef to walk on the Great Wall of China in a chef's jacket. And boy, what an experience that was. The Temple of the Sun, one of the oldest and greatest temples in all of Beijing, China. One of the things that I found interesting was in China, bicycles are used for everything, especially carrying food. You see this guy going to market with watermelons, and once he gets to the market, there's an array of different things available. Look at the spices. This is nice spices with ginger. Of course, some things aren't that good. This is some of the tomatoes we had to work with. Uh, I was really, really interested in this little setup because that uh, drum reminded me of a drum I saw in the French market of New Orleans baking garlic chicken, but here, this uh, wonderful Chinese lady was baking yams from China, and I tell you, I had a chance to eat some. Red beans, I thought red beans originated in the bayous of Louisiana, but I was wrong. Here they are in China, along with a big hill of bok choy cabbage, which we're gonna cook with uh, today. As I got to Japan, you can imagine how excited I was to work with all of the chefs of uh, uh, the great country of Japan, and, how, and, and the amount of ideas we exchanged as we uh, sat around the kitchens and talked. This is a family portrait. Oriental cooking, I just love it. Here's some of the uh, breast of duck, Peking duck, and the tongues of duck, yep. We use everything when we worked in uh, China, but this was my favorite dish, seven snake soup. Seven snakes into the dish, and I tell you, it was fabulous. And you have to know how to cook in Japan because you don't want to get any of your customers upset. I certainly didn't want to get the sumo wrestlers uh, upset. This is the markets in Japan. Look how beautiful it is. Fresh fish, dried fish, side by side, and oh yeah, a couple of fish heads for uh, stocks. I had an opportunity to do uh, a, a tea tasting in one of the tea ceremonies, and I'm going to show you the teacup that I actually used in Japan. This is some of that uh, hard green tea with a little candy next to it to make it a little bit more palatable. And on I went to uh, Hong Kong in the great beautiful harbor with the largest 
floating restaurant in existence on the globe. This restaurant sat about 3,000 people, and this was another restaurant, one that sat about 10. You can see the difference in those two restaurants. This little ferry I took across the waters every day to pick up some of my fish and produce that I actually used uh, in the restaurant. This market had all of the live goods and nice spices, every single thing that I needed every day, the ducks and chickens and uh, uh, fresh fruit all came into this market daily, just an array of anything you can imagine. In all of the restaurants, everything had to be live. And here you see the fish tanks. Uh, this is actually in the restaurants and in some of the markets where you go in and pull the fish live right out of the tanks. Otherwise, the Orientals will just not bring anything into the restaurants that's not alive. Crawfish and fresh fish and lobster right into the uh, tanks to be cleaned, into the skillets to be sauteed. And this was actually uh, the done dish after you saw us cleaning it in that little uh, shot before. The Oriental chefs, just masters at God the art of decorating. And this young guy, I showed how to make the floating isles, the premier dessert of Louisiana. You can see those meringue shells. And I took something back home. I brought back with me the art of decorating and the pretty colors you'll see me use right here in our Taste of Louisiana. And yep, this is Louisiana, Lafitte's Landing Restaurant, my home in the bayous, and some of the great dishes that we brought back after working with the Orientals and Soviets and uh, people of Hong Kong and all of these different nations to create the dishes that we uh, do so much of today. One of the things that I found out as I travel around the globe is that there's very little difference in what we do. There's a lot of different ingredients that we all use, but by the same token, very little difference in how we put it all together. And I was really shocked as I travel around to see some of the dishes that I thought where original Louisiana dishes actually crop up in all of these different countries. And uh, I, I had to think a little bit about, hey, this is where these dishes originate. And we just changed it a little bit using the ingredients of Louisiana. So I want to tell you a little bit about four of the dishes that we're going to do today that I did find in other countries that have real roots right here in South Louisiana. And the first one that I'm going to do is a dish that I discovered in the Soviet Union. And I'm going to uh, just kick this fire up a little bit. I want to talk about a stir-fried chicken from Tbilisi, Georgia. Georgia is the, uh, the, the, the one area of the Soviet Union that's really known for great, great food, great cooking, and cooking that's a lot like we do here in South Louisiana. A lot of the same spices, a lot of the same ingredients. I'm going to put a touch of butter or butter blend oil or uh, any kind of low-fat oil, olive oil, whatever you'd like to use, right into the black iron skillet of the Cajuns. And you see this beautiful bowl. This was actually given to me by the Soviets. It's a little bowl that they work with in the kitchens, and it's a lacquered bowl, so it's got a lot of beautiful colors, and I'm using it with a lacquered spoon to actually put my chicken down right into the dish this morning. I'm going to stir fry oh, some breast of chicken. This is going to be some nice little pieces. I'm going to put this out of the way. And I'm going to stir fry the chicken quickly in the black iron skillet, and it's amazing how chicken is found just in every, every nationality when it comes to cuisine. Everybody has a special chicken dish. And of course, in uh, Italy, we found the chicken cacciatores. In Louisiana, the chicken creoles. And here, the stir-fried chickens of Tbilisi, Georgia. And once we stir-fry the chicken quickly in the black iron skillet, the Soviets would always put in whole garlic pods because we have a garlic chicken here in Louisiana. But look at these nice little garlic pods. Again, a little lacquered bowl. And the garlic will quickly start to flavor uh, the dish. And then, back to Louisiana. Onions. We always put onions in our dish, but so did the, uh, the Georgians of Tbilisi. We also put celery. And of course, they did too. Fresh tomato is something we use a lot of. And they use tomato products in this chicken dish in Georgia. They were very interested and nice colors also in the dish. Uh, a primitive dish, but a very, very tasty dish. And to that, of course, I'm going to add a little bit more of the chopped garlic because Georgians love a lot of garlic. You notice I'm using a little wooden spoon here. This spoon was actually given to me by the Chinook Indians. And the Chinook Indians around British Columbia, when I was cooking there one year, they all cooked with these wooden spoons, and I thought they were nice. So I'm using it in my Russian dish today. Stir fry the chicken and the tomato around. And then into that, I'm going to put some fresh tomato sauce. This is almost like the Creole dish, like the shrimp Creoles or the chicken Creoles 
of the city of New Orleans. That's why I was so interested in this dish the minute I discovered it. Okay, into that. Now we're going back to the Soviet Union. Potatoes. They thicken with potatoes rather than flour as we do with the Cajun roux. Potatoes into the dish, and then cabbages. Red and green cabbages, which gave the dish a real Soviet look, but at the same time, a use of very primitive but good hearty vegetables. So this dish, as you can see, is starting to take on an international look. It could fit just about into any country, and now a little bit chicken stock to make a nice gravy in the bottom of the pot. Just a little bit touch of chicken stock, and then I'll season it, and the way the Soviet seasoned it, a little bit salt, a little bit cracked black pepper, and then I'm going to reach over here and get my little Chinook Indian bowl, and I'm going to put some basil right down into it, which the Georgians used a lot of. And I'll let this simply sit here and stir fry for another couple minutes until it's all done, and then we'll serve it on top of a batter rice, just like we do here in the bayous of South Louisiana. A great, great dish given to us by the Georgians of Tbilisi and the Soviet Union, but at the same time, a dish that could just as easily have been discovered in the bayous of South Louisiana and named chicken a la creole, just as, uh, just as the shrimp creoles that we have. I'll let this dish sit here, and let me wipe my hands. I'll let this dish sit and simmer for a couple minutes. I'll put it on this low back burner. I want it to just sit and simmer quickly. So I'll move that out of the way. And I want to tell you about another dish that probably is the origin of one of the premier rice dishes of South Louisiana. When we think of a rice dish in South Louisiana, the first thing that we're going to think of is jambalaya. And jambalaya is, I guess, as, as Native American to South Louisiana as paella is to Spain and to Italy and to the Mediterranean coast in the south of France. And as I traveled into all of those countries and worked with the chefs of those nations, I quickly started to discover that their premier rice dish was a lot like our premier rice dish. And all of a sudden, I thought for sure I had found the origin of our own jambalaya. And I want to show you how the Creoles of Louisiana probably would have taken that early dish of paella and turned it into a Louisiana classic. We're going to be begin, of course, with a nice paella pan. Now, look how pretty this is. I'm going to put this nice pan right here. And of course, since I discovered this in Spain, I'm going to put a little olive oil down into the bottom of it because they always used olive oil. Now, of course, the early paella pans were put on top of fire and all the ingredients stir fried. But today, there's a way to make it just a little bit quicker. And you don't sacrifice any of the flavor. So I want to show you how uh, I learned to do this dish. We're going to, of course, put a little onions down into the bottom of the pan, a little bit celery down into the bottom again. Of course, garlic. A lot of nice garlic again, because after all, we're in Italy, we're in Spain, we're in the Provence region of France, where all the great herbs and spices are used in such quantity. So this dish would have been brought to Louisiana, would have been brought to New Orleans probably by the Spanish in the late 1600s, and when not being able to find all of the ingredients that they normally made the paella with, they probably started to look around the swamp floor for new ingredients, and that's what we've done to recreate this dish. Into that, we're going to put some fresh tomato, a lot of nice tomato down into it, just like that. Okay, and then I want to show you all of these other ingredients. Look at here, going into the paella pot. The ingredients of Louisiana, we would have to have nice crawfish tails, because crawfish, of course, are indigenous to the bayous. We would have to put andouille sausage. The Italians and the Spanish would have used chorizo, or one of these other great sausages, but we're going to put in andouille, the Cajun ham, inside of the casing. Into that, tasso, which was given to us by the Germans, but a very nice smoked ham to really flavor the Louisiana paella. Of course, boneless breast of chicken, and I've poached this chicken off in advance because I'm going to make the paella with a little chicken stock, and I'm going to res reserve the stock from this chicken. Of course, shrimp. 
In Louisiana, we have a multitude of different shrimps, but I'm using river shrimp right out of the Mississippi River, a real nice freshwater shrimp, as well as some head-on saltwater lake shrimp. So I've got two or three different shrimp into the dish. And then some clams. We do have clams on the Gulf of Mexico, so I'll put a couple of those in. And some nice fresh tomatoes, and of course, we have to add rice. Rice is the main ingredient in the paella, so we'll stir in a long grain rice. Of course, use whatever rice you would like, but I'm going to put in long grain. And then into that, the chicken stock. For every cup of rice, I always like to put about a cup and a half of stock, and your rice will be perfect every time. If you put a cup of rice to a cup and a half of liquid, you'll have a great, great rice dish. Now, to color it, I'm going to use a little bit saffron because that, this is the spice that's uh, very expensive. It's the stigmas of flowering plants, and it's hand-picked, so naturally, it's going to give a real nice color as well as a nice flavor to the dish, but I'm gonna tell you, it's so expensive, I would recommend using just yellow food coloring and don't tell anybody any different. Just put it on in, and then of course, a little salt. Gotta have salt in the dish. A little pepper. Put it right down into that. And then some more of the fresh tomatoes on top. And then the golden and red bell pepper, because we want a lot of color in the paella. And then we're going to finish with green onions. We have to have green onions on top, and then fresh little shelled green peas. There was always peas put in the paella, so we're going to do the same thing. Of course, in Louisiana, we put black-eyed peas, red beans, white beans, a multitude of different things. But I want you to see just how pretty this is, and I'll use another one of these old Chinook Indian spoons that I was given in British Columbia to stir it all together, to mix all the pretty colors. And I would put this into the oven for about an hour on 375 to 400 degrees. I would cover it first with a little aluminum foil to keep the steam in. And then I would take it out of the oven. All of these nice seafood flavors would have come together into the pot to really create a nice broth. And the rice would just suck it all up. And that's where your great flavors would come from. And I have some already in the oven, which I want to show you. So I'll move this right out of the way. And let me get my towels here. Paella already done. Oh, you talk about beautiful. No wonder they wanted to bring this dish with them from Spain. Look how gorgeous this is. Louisiana style paella. 200 years later, using all of the ingredients that were found in the bayous of South Louisiana, but with the technique given to us by the Frenchmen of the Provence area of France, the Spanish from uh, all of the areas of Spain, of course, probably the Italians as well. Again, dish it all up, and we'll serve this, a nice bowl of it, to everybody coming to eat dinner with us tonight. So I'll just move this right out of the way. Of course, a little later, our uh, Russian chicken dish will be ready, and I'll serve that over a nice bowl of rice. And we've got some other Oriental dishes that I picked up when I was in Hong Kong and Japan, and we've got those all ready to go using the ingredients of Louisiana as well. But now, I want to talk about a great friend of mine who was, as I say, was right there with me as we travel around the world, Alec Gifford from the city of New Orleans. And I tell you, I know Alec is somewhere yeah, around. Right there he here, is. Fellow. How you doing? <laughs> nice you, seeing you. Man, do you smell all that good cooking oh, it going on? Great. You don't really need any help out here, do you? I always need help. Why would I call you if I didn't need help, huh? <laughs> you, uh, need, you need help like I need a hole in the head. <laughs> Hang on a second. Hey, what Alex, are we doing? Hey, throw that coat off and let's talk a little bit about international cooking. You know, okay. you've been in the food business, per se, in the city of New Orleans for a long time because you have your own uh, local cooking show there and you talk to a lot of chefs and, and, and I know you know a lot about food. What, in your opinion, is the single biggest difference between uh, uh, the chefs of Louisiana and the chefs of all other places you've traveled and talked and whatever else. Well, John, I think, I think you're probably as good an example of any, as anybody of what the differences are. When you go overseas and you start running into chefs over there, you realize that almost every foreign country, especially in Europe, chefs are licensed many times by the government. They have to go through a huge, long period where, where just as kids, they live almost like slaves in the kitchen of some great master chef who kicks them in the rear end when they need a kick in the rear end, very seldom pats them on the head, and finally someday they get their license and they learn to be a chef. 
Chuck, did you know in London a cab driver, for example, has to ride around on a bicycle for about a year and a half before he finally becomes a chef, you know? So, you know, it's just a whole different ball game. But chefs like you just grew up in the bayous here in South Louisiana, kind of learned cooking at your mother's knee and in your mother's kitchen, as a lot of those chefs did. And what amazes me, truthfully, John, is how a guy like you, down at a little place called Lafitte's Landing at Donaldsonville, <laughs> ever, ever gets invited overseas to go to places like, like Rome with the Pope, to Japan, to China. How, how, do, how do things like that happen? Well, 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 how, do they, how do they discover us over there, John? <laughs> well, well, I think, first of all, uh, American cuisine is the new thing all over the world. People are very interested in American cooking. Naturally, they're interested in American chefs. And I just have such a love for South Louisiana cooking that uh, I felt somebody really needed to bring that message of American cooking around the world. And I, I don't know, I asked a couple of countries and they said, yeah, come on over because American cuisine is very interesting to them. And I brought the... Uh, I brought Lafitte's yeah. Landing to seven countries, so it's been a, 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 an interesting venture, so to speak. Now, you were with me uh, on the Soviet-American Culinary Exchange when I brought the 10 Soviet chefs to the United States. You sat with them a lot more than I did. What was their uh, reaction to American restaurants and American cooking? Well, for, first of all, remember, conditions are rather spare over there in the Soviet Union, right? I mean, they, right. Just, they don't have a restaurant every corner like we do down here, and they sure as heck don't have grocery stores like we have in supermarkets and things like that. Although they do have their open air markets, like in most European countries, Chuck, you'll find every Wednesday. They have a big open air market in the middle of town, and all these chefs come in and buy their stuff. But these guys came over here, and I think they were absolutely blew their minds to see the kind of food uh, uh, production and systems that we have in this country. And I really thought for a while those Russian chefs who came with us to that catfish farm over there in Mississippi could not believe it. I think they thought we were putting them on until they saw <laughs> 10 million acre feet of water stocked with fresh catfish going all over the world, including the Russians, right? Uh, yeah, I think you're probably right. I yeah. mean, uh, uh, at first they thought that probably it was a little staged, but as they went on, they quickly uh, learned that that was, in fact, the cuisine available all over the United States. So anyway, I thank you so much for doing all of that with me, and we're going to cook a little bit now. I have a little Russian chicken going here, and now I'm going to Put the last flavoring in it. You know what this is? Can you good. guess what's in this little bottle here? No, what's in uh, it? Aha, uh -huh, that's vodka, vodka, as they say in Russia. That's the last spice that goes down into the chicken. Mm. Now, let me tell you what we're going to do. When I was in Japan, I discovered a little bitty dessert dish that I fell in love with. And after, gee, I didn't want to take care of the skillet here. Uh, and after thinking about it a little while, I discovered that that dish was probably the origin of our own bananas foster. So in I'm Japan. Gonna, in Japan. So I'm going to go ahead and throw this together quickly while you stir. I know you've got a spoon Wait, there. Yeah. I'm going to put a little bit of butter down into the dish, and we're going to melt that butter. And I have here right. a little sugared ginger. I'm going to put just a little bit sugared ginger down into the bottom of the pot. And that ginger will come together. I'm going to kick that flame up to make sure we get a lot of good heat on there. You melt that butter. Boy, the Japanese love ginger. Woo, talk about. And then from there, I'm going to put in these nice bananas because all of these bananas are available all over the world. And I tell you what, a lot of bananas were being used in Japan with ginger and sugars. And oh, yeah. I think this actually is, in fact, the origin of our own bananas foster. They used a little bit cinnamon as we did we got a nice little chinese yeah. bowl they used a little bit nutmeg and how's my stuff coming there you keeping it stirring around only that over here oh, no it is bananas oh, here oh excuse me john <laughs> pardon me i don't know i messed up already <laughs> you messed up already i thought you were an expert at listen, all listen john the more, you, the more you travel around aren't you amazed at how little new there is in the world how much things people copy from each other all over the, like you found that paella Probably a 200-year-old dish. Uh, absolutely. There's no question about it, but I don't think it's copy. I think what it is is that over the years, uh, foods just kind of find their way into a country, and then people adapt to whatever it is that they have in their own area. So that's what's happening right here in the United States. We're a nation of different nations all coming together, and that's what we find right here. Everything coming together in the pot. Now, a little bit. Banana liqueur. Now, this may flame up on you. Yeah. Stand back. Fire and hold. Uh, okay. Now, just stir that around a little. And you, you want to flame? flame up. Yeah, you can flame it if you want. Now, I'll tell you what I want you to do. In the freezer here, yes, sir. two good bowls of praline ice cream. Why don't you get in? We'll test out this nice little recipe here. There you go. Oh, this is a really nice dish. And as I say, I think was the forefather of our Bananas Foster of New Orleans. I'm going to go ahead and... Put in some of that nice sauce well, right on top good. of it. Doesn't mm. that look good? And I'm going to put 
a couple bananas in it. There you go. Take hold of that. I'm going to no. get you a spoon. Isn't that nice? There is nothing that tastes better than hot <sighs> liquids over cold ice cream. And, and I'm using cane syrup in here instead of honey, which is what they used in Japan. I'll cut that fire off and get you a little spoon. There uh, you go. Take a taste. I'll take a taste. Oh, uh, boy, I tell you that what. Good. I wish that you could sit here and taste this great, great, great uh, bananas dish. Oh, is it of like? Japan, yeah, I think it's the... Is it like Bananas Foster? Is it like Ooh. Bananas Foster? I mean, it really... And this is a Japanese recipe. Japanese recipe, really right out of the out yeah. of the island of Japan, but found its way to New Orleans. Listen, I don't know how much time you got left, but i got to ask you a question. Go ahead. What was the Pope like? He was a great guy. Great, great guy. What Fabulous did you, fellow. What do you think of your Goomba? Oh, he <laughs> loved it. You know, we sent him gumbo every month. You know, I, I told you that story. He loved gumbo so much mm -hmm. that at some point in time, he decided to... Uh, have us send it over to him. So John, I wouldn't want to think that you were impressed, but I noticed when you were most of your shots, you were wearing your chef suit. When you were the Pope, you were wearing a suit. Well, I had to give him respect. I had to give him respect in his own kitchen. Quick question. Alec, he speak English or French? He, sp he spoke English. Alec, let me tell you. All right. I can't thank you enough for being here. I can't thank you enough for being a part of all of my international travels. Uh, and John. I, hope, I hope we do a lot more of it, but I want to tell everyone out here, thank you for visiting with us. And Make sure you come back next time, and we'll just continue to cook up more of these great taste of Louisiana. Hey, time let's for keep lunch. on going. Yeah, time for lunch. Time for paella. Huh? <laughs> Thank you, John. Really enjoyed it. Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Bruce's yams and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. Additional funding is provided by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Anytime, any place in Louisiana, we're really cooking. The companion cookbook to A Taste of Louisiana is available for $22.95. The Evolution of Cajun and Creole Cuisine by Chef John Fulce features recipes and food history behind Louisiana's cuisine. This 352-page cookbook contains over 250 recipes, including those from this show. To order, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen.